Good evening, everyone. First of all, and I want to uh, express our appreciation for all of you who are in attendance for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening. We really do un understand and appreciate how hard it is to to get away from a busy practice. And of course, also it's taken away from family time. So it's deeply appreciated. We're very fortunate tonight to have uh, our um, uh, speaker, uh, one who is very experienced with the topic of 10X. And I think probably most importantly or equally importantly is extremely well-versed and knowledgeable with regard to one of the most pressing issues of the day, not just for 10X, but for medicine in general. And that is, appropriate reimbursement and coding and, and changes in the uh, in the rules that we have to live by. So it's a real uh, pleasure and, and honor to introduce Tom Durek. Tom is an anesthesiologist by training, is a, a subspecialization, it's actually pain medicine, and he has a tremendous experience uh, with 10X and has been using this for quite a number of years, using this technology. So with that, and to avoid taking any more time from Tom, I'll turn it over to Tom. But as mentioned, is the, uh, during the presentations, there'll be several phases, the technology, some uh, clinical examples, and then some financial or reimbursement issues. So please uh, write your questions as they occur to you, and we'll try to have enough time at the end to answer all that, uh, uh, that we can. So Tom, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mori. Uh, and I would like to also uh, welcome everybody from uh, east to west. I'm currently in California, so it's it's a little bit earlier here. For those of you who are giving up your evenings to uh, listen to me, I, I really do appreciate it. And I want to thank 10X Health and especially Dr. Mori for all he's done over the many years that he's been associated uh, with 10X. Uh, for most of you, if, if you're aware, Dr. Mori is, is a genuine living le legend, and I have the pleasure of meeting him a couple years ago. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful that he asked me to launch the 2018 webinar series for 10X to uh, go over kind of a three-part process with the, the technology and what uh, battles we face and what victories we've won to date. The first part of my talk is going to be reviewing the actual technology behind the percutaneous tenotomy using the 10F, 10X health system. And for those of you who are either new to the technology or have used it but don't really know as much about it. I'll go over some of that without getting too technical. The second part will be my experience. Uh, I've got uh, almost five years of experience uh, doing percutaneous tenotomies on almost every body part and was one of the first ones to get the two-inch probe when it came out about two years ago. And the last part will go over the, the difficult part of the billing and coding, which I'll try and make uh, as exciting as possible. Uh, I'm not going to turn my webcam on at that point because that would make it much worse, but try and face some of the um, restrictions and difficulties that everybody is facing right now with the technology. So again, my name is Tom Durek. I'm an anesthesiologist. I'm currently practicing in Fremont Surgery Center in Fremont, California, which is one of the top five busiest surgery centers in the nation month to month. And uh, again, Dr. Mori was uh, gracious enough to um, allow me to do this talk with you. The first part I'm going to talk about is the actual um, disease process and what happens when you take an intact tendon that is injured. Um, doesn't have to be traumatic, it can be repetitive motion, uh, work-related, is there's usually an inflammatory reaction which causes a tendinopathy. That tendon becomes injured. And the tendon really has three choices. It can heal, it can um, stay in this reactive stage for a long period of time, or it can degenerate. And what we find that is about 75% of the patients will respond to just conservative care whether it's ice, physical therapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories within four months, but about 15% of those will recur within a year. And the peak incidence of this happens between the ages of 40 and 60 years old. Um, our goal obviously is to always try and get them into a heel safe. When we deal mostly with the medial lateral epicondylitis, which is the most common thing that we saw initially when we were doing the percutaneous tenotomy with the 10X system, um, was what we saw with most of the chronic tendinopathies. And so these are people who would have, this is the tendinopathy with the epicondylitis. They're gonna have their symptoms. Most of them, about 80% will recover at six months, but there's still that 20% that have symptoms well beyond that. And what we see is some people have a healing that can take up to two years for that chronic tendinopathy. We're not talking about the acute tendon injury 
that goes away in two weeks to three months. This is the chronic tendon injury that just never goes away. Um, and we, again, we see that about 15% of those chronic tendon injuries, even if they go away in a short period of time, will recur. So the standard before the percutaneous tenotomy was to do an open surgical procedure um, where the surgeon actually goes in, makes an incision, cuts the tendon, and a lot of times they'll actually remove it from the insertion, uh, especially here if we're doing the common extensor tendon, try and clean up what, what they are visualizing to be the damaged part of the tendon, which you can't always tell. And I've worked with literally dozens of surgeons, and I ask them, especially when they don't know my, my um, true uh, passion for the percutaneous tenotomy with tenex, how do you tell what's good and what's bad? And, and they used to say, well, I just kind of scrape the tendon off and then reinsert it. And that's kind of the reason why it really is an underwhelming um, procedure that has about a 15% success rate. And then also with the cortisone injection, this actually masks the, the, uh, the pain and really can damage the tissue and the bone. And I'm an absolute example of that. I've had both of my elbows injected a long time before the uh, percutaneous tenotomy procedure became popular. And I actually have bone loss on the periosteum on both of my um, lateral epicondyles. So the goal was to try and replicate the surgical approach, but with a minimally invasive process that used ultrasound to guide uh, the, the TX1 system, the microtip, into the damaged part of the tendon, which you see on that little image on the bottom left, the dark part is the hypoechoic, or the part that does not reflect the sound waves under ultrasound as well, using a disposable instrument. And so of that, we learned that there wasn't just the two stages in the treatment where it was conservative therapy or surgery, that we were able to find a minimally invasive middle of the road system, which is where Tenex Healthcare came in, because it's really the only minimally invasive option that can actually, it treats the pain. It removes the damaged tendon. So it's not something where you're just doing needle, uh, doing multiple needles into it. It's not where you're putting heat or laser and just poking a bunch of holes or using hypertonic saline to try and cause an inflammatory reaction. Most of these tendons are not very vascular to begin with. So all those other systems are simply trying to jumpstart the inflammatory system of the body in a part that isn't really uh, very vascular to begin with. The Tenex Health System actually physically removes that damaged part of the system. And you can see that while you're doing it on your ultrasound screen. And what I like to do is show my patients that so they can see when I start the procedure, when I show you the examples. Here's the dark part that isn't reflecting the sound, what we call hypoechoic. Lookout's all lighter now, the actual tendon is, is better, and we see that. Um, the best time to go in is once that chronic pain has reached three months, because we know at that point they could face that very slow ups, upslope of the curve where they could be in that two-month process to two years to where they actually heal. And once you get to six months, it's, it's the best time to go in with the minimally invasive procedure of the percutaneous tenotomy. And we see how it works. It actually delivers an ultrasonic energy with both of the TX1 and the TX2. One is a one inch, one is a two inch uh, microtip. And it actually physically cuts. It emulsifies and removes the damaged tendon. It spares the healthy tissue because the healthy tendon absorbs that ultrasound energy differently than does the damaged tendon. Um, the resonance of that is, uh, is truly different for necrotic tissue versus healthy tendon. And what you see is through that microtip, for those of you who've never done it before, the microtip that you insert through a very tiny incision into that tissue is doing three things. The one is that it's actually removing that damaged part of the tendon through both the um, harmonic resonance and the actual jackhammering effect of the tip of the, of the TX uh, micro, microchip. It's irrigating with sterile saline, which cools the tip. And it also has a suction, so it's physically removing both the saline that was put in there and the damaged part of the tendon. So you are physically removing this. And it comes with the TX1 console, which gives you precise abilities to target and use uh, different suction modalities and different amounts of um, energy to help treat the, the damaged part of the tendon. And on the right, you see that it's, it's about the size of an 18 gauge needle. It feels like a big pen, but it's about the size of an 18 gauge needle. And every time you activate the foot pedal attached to the console, the TX1 system is, is doing its job. It's delivering that ultrasonic harmonic energy, and it's going ahead with uh, getting rid of that damaged tendon. It's entirely disposable. There's no chance of cross-contamination. Um, this is a short video that shows how the procedure actually works. 
And this is a ladder for condyle where we do a small puncture incision very close to your ultrasound probe with an 11 blade. And then under ultrasound guidance, after you've injected some local, of course, you're placing that TX1 tip right into the hypochoic area that shows you, you can see where that necrotic tendon is, the damaged tendon. When you step on the pedal and activate the tip of that, um, the three things happen. The irrigation, the suction, and then the actual debridement with the ultrasonic harmonic energy and the cutting of necrotic tissue. And the first few times you do it, it's actually a pretty impressive process. It's a good feeling because when you see that hypochoic area disappearing, you know you're doing some good things for your patient. Here we can see on the ultrasound on the left, the hypochoic area and the TX1 microtip starting to come into that area of the lateral of a condyle. And when you activate that in healthy tendon, it really does no damage to it. There's really no damage done to the healthy tendon. If you were to activate that foot pedal for five minutes and just leave it in the same spot, then you can cause some damage. But again, that's not what the point. That's not what you're there to do. So again, the percutaneous tenotomy or fasciotomy, it's really just a simple three-step process. You find the disease tendon with your ultrasound probe, and you can see that because it's hypoechoic. Under local anesthesia, you guide the TX microtip into the damaged tissue under ultrasound, activate the foot pedal in step three, and you cut and remove the damaged tendon. The patient selection, again, we usually go once they've gone three months uh, of conservative treatment with no resolution of their symptoms. Most of the time, the patient will point to you with one finger. When you tell them, where is your pain? They're going to point right over that lateral condyle, right over their patellar tendon, mid-substance of the Achilles, plantar fascia, same thing. As soon as you put your ultrasound probe on the area of either thickened tendon or the point of maximum tenderness, you're going to be able to very easily see the hypoechoic region that reflects the sound waves much less than the normal tendon, and that area is going to appear dark because these fibers are necrotic, they're disorganized, and the tendon is usually thickened at that point. And we can see from one of the great studies by Dr. Ko, uh, where they measured, they did these patients and followed them at six weeks, six months, one year, and then up to three years, where their visual analog scores and their DASH, the disability of the arm, shoulder, and hand scores, markedly reduced in uh, 20 out of 20 patients, even after three years. They didn't have a single patient that had pain after three years after having uh, the percutaneous tenotomy with the 10X healthcare health system. Um, and 100% of the patients were satisfied, and that's also the beautiful thing with this, is the satisfaction you get uh, from your patients. And you see, again, this is three years they follow these patients out. With your ultrasound, if you have the ability to do the PDI uh, with your ultrasound, you can see this is, this is a reflection of the amount of inflammation in the area. And this is the same patient from that study that they followed at time zero, six months, um, I'm sorry, three months, six months, and then three years. And you can see the inflammation in that tendon where the hypoechoic area in that upper left where there's a lot of inflammation, and then at 36 months, it's basically normal with no inflammation. Um, and to show you some of the results that are in the current literature, uh, this is from the Journal of Orthopedic Surgery and Research in there uh, by Dr. Caminini, uh, where they, they had found that um, they did percutaneous ultrasound debridement, um, and this was in uh, Achilles rabbits, uh, and then they followed it up with uh, the actual collagen measurements in patients, and they found that in situ, and then also in patients, that under direct ultrasound visualization, it actually can cure the patients with the recalcitrant tendinopathies. No open surgery, and they obviously agree that this would re markedly reduce healthcare costs because they found that actually restored the collagen to the normal collagen one type that was seen in normal in, in patients that didn't have disease on the, the opposite side. Um, the next one is in the American Journal of, of Sports Medicine, and again, this is the one I referred to with Dr. Ko earlier, where you saw that slide showing the patients who are 100% satisfied. Very nice study where they followed these patients three years out uh, with the percutaneous tenotomy through the TENIC system, and they found not only sustained pain relief, but all these patients had a complete functional improvement at three years and were able to get back to all of their normal activities prior to having the procedure. Um, and they found that this was actually so far superior for surgical to uh, surgical intervention in treating, again, this recalcitrant, this, this completely difficult to heal tendinopathy at the elbow. Uh, the next study is one uh, by Dr. Barnes that was in the journal of shoulder and elbow surgery. And you can see their findings in there. 
same thing. They did 12 patients for the lateral epicondylitis, seven for the medial epicondylitis. They had an 88% satisfactory uh, range, and they found that one year out, these patients actually had uh, no pain uh, for the refractory medial and lateral epicondylitis done under local anesthesia, and they also agree this is a very safe and very effective procedure. A couple of the quick studies to go through with you. Um, on the top one, Dr. Stowers did a patellar tendinopathy study and found that all 10 of them uh, were able to return to their pre-injury state uh, a year out. There was no pain in any of the patients. And then uh, a nice study in patellar tendinopathy by uh, Dr. Neil Elitrosh uh, from Curl and Job Orthopedic Group. Um, they've done this procedure on several NBA players and several Major League Baseball players. And you can see Dr. Stephen Yoon also joined him in this study on there where they had 22 patients uh, follow them up for 12 months, and again, 85% satisfaction rate for patellar tendinopathy. Um, the last uh, few that I want to go over with you, the first one is from the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery, 26 patients for insertional Achilles tendinopathy, 92% satisfaction, followed them out for 16 months. The next one was presented at the Society of Interventional Radiology in 2015. A uh, pretty good-sized study, 100 patients in there followed out for 12 months. And they found that 90% of these patients had a complete resolution of their symptoms and were satisfied with the procedure one year out. And then the last one from the American Journal of Orthopedics had 12 patients for plantar fasciitis, follow them out for a year, 12 out of 12 patients were pain-free. So far to date, um, there have been over 65,000 procedures done since 2011 using the TX Health system. And the majority of these have been on the elbow, the plantar fascia, and the Achilles. And most recently, with the introduction of the TX2, the two-inch probe, we're now able to treat a lot of the gluteal medius injuries and also some of the calcific tendinopathies that occur in the shoulder. And I'll show you some examples of these right here. You can see um, these are two patients where on this side, here's a big calcific tendinopathy in the supraspinatus. And then the post findings after the treatment is virtually gone. And the same thing in this patient. Pretty good calcific tendinopathy and just about gone as we go along. Um, the other thing that I've been able to treat uh, is doing some AC joints. If you have a chronic bicep tendinopathy, you can actually, under direct ultrasound guidance, place this right into the bicipital sheath and use it, if that's specific under ultrasound, to help debride or um, diminish some of the swelling in and around there. Um, in the 65,000 patients who've been treated, treated, there's only been eight complications. So just an incredibly low complication rate. There's only been two tendon ruptures, and one of those patients, it was early on, the patient was on a fluoroquinolone, um, and they already had about a 75% uh, tendon uh, rupture to begin with, and this was kind of a last-ditch effort. There's only been one ner a nerve injury, two infections, three probes that, that broke throughout the entire procedure, and I can tell you that's something you should never ha have happen. So that's, in my opinion, just misuses of the probe, and not one single ligamentous injury. So to sum up the first part of this, um, the TX1, TX2 probes, it's a percutaneous treatment. It's similar to doing a cortisone injection as far as hands-on, but it has the efficacy of surgery without the markedly increased cost and the morbidity. And then Dr. Morley was kind enough to help me with these two slides, and I apologize they're a little bit busy, but I do want to go over some of this stuff because the amount of injuries in the United States that this can, can treat is just staggering when you get into the actual process. Um, she has 135.7 million workers in the United States up there and over 2 billion in work comp costs in 2016 alone. And what we, when Dr. Mori found is that 55% of these costs were paid by insurance companies, 25% by the employers, 15% by the state, and only 5% by the federal government on there. And again, over 62.3 billion claims were paid in 2014, and about half of them were for work that was lost. The other half is for the medical expense. The reason this becomes very important, because with the percutaneous tenop uh, tendinopathy, I mean, the percutaneous tenotomy, you're talking people losing six to eight weeks of work versus just a couple days, three to four days. It is, a, it is a marked improvement, not in just the resolution of the symptoms and in curing the disease, but also in the time frame that the injured worker is away from work. Um, the non-medical benefits uh, were increasing, not only because of the lost work days, but as we all know about, we see on the news every day, the use of opioids. A lot of these patients with the chronic tendinopathies 
uh, they become addicted to narcotics because it's six months, nine months, one year out, they're not getting better. So there's another huge cost savings and an improvement to patient care. And 17% of all of those costs were just for prescription drugs. So almost a third of all work comp injuries are musculoskeletal. With 650,000 injuries a year, they result in days of work loss. 11 days is the mean loss for musculoskeletal injury, eight days for non-musculoskeletal injuries. $31 billion paid for non-back injuries for musculoskeletal disease. And $8,070 was the mean cost per claim for upper extremity. So the important, the important part comes now down to these numbers in there for repetitive tendon injuries. We see 3.3 million tendon injuries uh, per year. And the average cost for six months of non-operative management is over $14,000. If you add surgical management to that, it becomes close to $32,000. A huge amount of money that we're spending to treat these patients, and they're not getting better. With the percutaneous tenotomy, we can see that by the time you get down to physical therapy, steroid injection, the patients on opioids, it can be you know, up to three, four thousand dollars a month in medications. If you take that 157 million workers, it would be the same as if we paid $579 for every single worker in the United States every time when there was a disability, just to treat the musculoskeletal injuries in those patients. Tenex can come in and can save significant amount of money. Again, the conservative therapy, $14,500. Tenex saves them $8,600. For surgical, saves them almost $26,000 in cost to the insurer. And this is the work comp data on there. So it's not only making patients better faster and curing the patients, it's saving them time and saving them huge amounts of money. So I'll, I'll apologize briefly for the rapidity with which I speak. Um, but that's the first part uh, of the presentation, just going over where 10X fits into all of that. Um, the second part that I want to get into is, is my experience and letting you know how I got involved with the percutaneous tenotomy and why Dr. Mori actually asked me to uh, do this webinar. Um, I ran a surgery center in Oakland for 12 years, and I was the um, a clinical anesthesiologist. I was in charge of all the finances as the administrator. And I was also in charge of our billing office. So I was able to see every technology, every surgery, what we did, and the profit margin on every case. Uh, I became quite facile at doing case costing. So I knew what every, to the penny, what our cases cost us. Um, so again, the financial side, because I was actually coding every case, we, we set the fees. I worked with all of our work comp payers. Uh, I worked with, with the case managers, the nurse uh, case managers, the adjusters, uh, with our uh, billing and collections department. I saw everything we paid and what we took in every case, every day for the 10 years that I did this. Um, and again, I ordered supplies, so I knew what everything cost. And then as an anesthesiologist, I've been doing ultrasound for, for 10 years. Uh, I've trained a lot of people to do ultrasound. I did fellowships in pain management and a fellowship uh, in neuroanesthesia. And I've also trained and proctored um, dozens of physicians in ultrasound guided procedures and probably hundreds of anesthesiologists in these same procedures. But running a facility, anytime somebody came to me with new technology, it had to meet this list of criteria. It had to work. Number one, it had to make people better. Number two, it had to be safe. I wanted the least investment that I could put into it. I wanted to be able to turn a profit immediately. I wanted CPT codes that were already in the system for both Medicare and work comp, because then I know if they're in Medicare and work comp, I know that my private payers are also going to have those codes in their system. I didn't want 30 minutes between cases to have to set up this new technology, so I wanted quick turnover, and I want very low fixed costs. So when, when we agreed to adopt 10X into our facility, I found that it did everything that I wanted for new technology. It worked. It made people better. The best results we had, we had with medial lateral epicondylitis, the chronic Achilles tendinopathies, and plantar fasciitis. We were having 85 to 90% patient satisfaction at six months and again to the year. It was also very safe. You saw only eight complications in 65,000 procedures. Uh, we had no complications in the several hundred that we did. And, and it worked. Um, since we already had an ultrasound machine, there was no big investment. Uh, there are newer, um, smaller handheld ultrasounds that are out that could markedly uh, reduce your investment if you're interested in those. Um, but most surgery centers should have an ultrasound, if not, shame on them. And again, it turned a profit with, on the first case. 
because all of the, the payments we received were higher than our fixed cost to do the case. The codes are already there. I'll go over those a little bit later on. We don't have to use unlisted codes for these procedures. The turnover was literally five minutes between cases because you have a disposable probe, you throw it away, get the next kit out, you're ready to go. Low fixed cost because we're paying for the probe. The kit comes with everything you need to do the case in there. Um, and that was it. These are all the areas that I've treated over the last uh, five years. The elbow, you can see the ankle. We've done not only the Achilles tendon, but we've done a lot of calcific tendonitis that people just really have no other choice. It's not something you want to go in and have a surgical excision for that calcific tendinopathy in there. We've done patients who just had a painful thickening of their Achilles. And again, with distal bone spurs. The knee, we've done patellar tendons, we've done distal quads, uh, a lot of calcific uh, tendinopathies, post-rupture and post-surgical. The two that are most satisfying are in the foot for the plantar fasciitis and the plantar fibromatosis. And I actually go in and measure with my ultrasound the thickness of the plantar fascia before I treat it and after. And I, I will send that off with my paper student insurance company to show them I actually took 34% of this plantar fascia and removed it. So it, to me, it's actually a fasciectomy more than a, 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 than a fasciotomy. The shoulder with the calcific tendonitis and the hip for the gluteus muscles. And then we actually had uh, one gentleman who was a boat builder um, that had both triceps, triceps that he had tendonitis and tendinopathy in, and we treated both of those. And uh, he actually called me about six months ago from New Zealand, uh, three years out, and was still pain-free. So the first 150 cases we did, we only had to repeat the procedure on two of them. One was the plantar fascia and one was Achilles. Because in our learning curve, um, both patients came back with persistent pain and their symptoms, symptoms weren't relieved. Uh, and again, these were our, within our first 35 cases. We were looking at the clock. We initially back in, um, I think it was 2013 when I first started doing these, we were kind of afraid to go over two minutes of actual treatment time uh, during the procedure. And what we found since then is we don't look at the clock, we watch the screen. We're watching our ultrasound uh, image on there. And we don't stop until the big fibroma or the thickening is gone. So if you're doing these right now, and if you think you're having a few failures, again, don't even look at, at how long uh, the time is. Experience really is golden. Uh, look at the image. And when you're done, when your image is, is better and you're satisfied, that's when you're done. Um, again, of our first 150 cases, we found the same success rate that's been all the literature. The kills in plantar fascia were 90% success rate. Um, and we followed these patients out for um, six months to a year. With the lateral epicondyle, we had 90% pain relief at six months and 80% with medial epicondyle. 13 out of 14 knee cases were pain-free at six months. And my one boat builder buddy, uh, he was still 100% pain-free, and he's three years out on there. And in our first 100, we had no complications. And again, the added treatment indicators are not just for that chronic tendonitis and tendinosis in there. You can break up calcifications within the tendon. And, and it is impressive to have somebody come in with a painful Achilles that had some tears in the past, formed these little microtic, microscopic lesions that end up with these big calcifications. You can literally bust those up. You can debride small bone spurs if they're really small. The thick and, and painful Achilles. Um, you can treat these interstitial tears that you won't see on MRI, but, but you can actually run the probe across those in the plantar fascia. Um, and I'll show you some examples uh, of those uh, in just a minute here. So we also found that something that was most important was to use the ultrasound the entire time during the procedure. It's not something you just injected your local and then put your probe on. The ultrasound probe that we use to visualize that damaged tendon stays on that tendon the entire time. Because when you inject the local at the beginning, you're not only creating your tract to get the TX1 or TX2 probe into, but you're going to find additional pathology sometimes, especially in the, the, the bigger tendons, in the Achilles, the quadriceps, and even the patellar tendon. As you're injecting, you will see that local anesthesia track up the tendon in an area you didn't think you needed to treat. You will see these, these um, interstitial tears that at the end of the case, once we treated the thickening of the tendon, We'll take that TX1 probe and we'll go and run it across and activate the handpiece and run it across that same interstitial tear to make sure we've caused some irritation in there and we'll, we'll try and get some scarring down to get rid of that interstitial tear. You're not going to see that on an MRI because these are under pressure with local anesthesia. I'll show an example um, in a second here. 
One little take home point, if you do see these uh, interstitial tears or if you're injecting the plantar fascia under ultrasound guidance and you're injecting from the medial side and you see your local blowing out on the lateral side, now you know you have a fascial tear. Their recovery is gonna take longer and they're probably not gonna do as well. They're probably gonna take six months to a year to get better and, and recover on there. So these are important things to look at. Um, the next one is an example of um, a, a lateral pecondyle with a common extensor tendon. And what you're seeing right here is this large area of local anesthesia from my needle coming in that I'm injecting. We're seeing how this tendon is actually separated right off the bone. There's a small strip of tendon that's still attached right onto the bone itself, but a huge area that was not seen on MRI that the local anesthesia filled up on there. We know that this patient's probably not going to do as well as the one who just has a hypochoic area that we saw. This is what we thought we were treating until we saw that this was completely torn off up here. Um, on the next slide, we're seeing a small spur, and this is my local anesthesia, and we're numbing it up. And then here, we're actually just tagging that spur, and you can see it's gone on that lateral condyle. We've eliminated that small bone spur, which was a, a point of soreness for that patient. The next one, we're going to see a plantar fascia. And as you inject, again, you see the fish mouth in here of that local anesthetic in the plantar fascia as you inject it under pressure. The plantar fascia goes up to here. This is the, the um, fat pad below the heel. So this patient probably isn't going to do as well with this tear besides this hypochoic area in there. A couple examples of a mid-substance tear uh, in the Achilles. This one is two parts. You can see the local anesthesia tracking up from my needle here but you're also seeing a secondary flow down more, more distal in this tendon where that local anesthesia is tracking. We were coming to treat this thickened area of the Achilles. We now knew we also had to treat down here. This was an area you're never gonna see on ultrasound. And if you're not looking under local, you're never gonna see it as well. One more example of this, we were treating this thickened Achilles and we see the local tracking way up here that we didn't even expect. We took our probe as before we finished and just tagged this area with a handpiece in activation mode went across that part of the tendon to try and roughen up both sides of that to cause uh, some of that tendon to adhere to, to the part below. Good example of patellar tendon pre and post procedure. I think everybody can see this huge hypoechoic area in this patellar tendon. This is a patella up here going down to the tibia below. And then post procedure, you can see that area is completely gone. Same patient just, you know, literally minutes later. Pretty impressive. And when you're showing the patient this, when you show them the before and after, before they even get out of your office or your operating room, they're already getting better because now they can see, oh yeah, the dark area is bad, the light area is good. Wow, I'm getting better. Here's a, that same patellar tendon on the, the cross-section view, um, both before and after. So here's the two areas of hypochoic nature before, and look at the volume we were able to resect and how much better that patellar tendon looks. Um, the last uh, couple I want to show you, this was a patellar tendon that we're treating under ultrasound guidance, very thick in patellar tendon with a big hypochoic area all the way along that we were treating. And when you see, when you activate it, the ultrasound probe will actually pick up the ultrasound being emitted from the TX1 handpiece. And uh, the last two are just some examples of a calcific tendonitis. This is a supraspinatus with a pretty good uh, calcific tendon uh, tendinopathy that we were able to treat. And then an Achilles tendon on both the longitudinal axis and cross-sectional axis before um, we did the treatment on there, these three big calcifications that we were able to treat. So what we, again, some of the outcomes that we found, we want you to, uh, longer recess, resection times might be better, especially with the Achilles and the plantar fascia. Treat the image and not the clock. We've gone as long as five minutes of actual treatment time for both the Achilles and plantar fascia when they get these big thickened Achilles or these uh, really big plant, plantar fibromas. Um, ultrasound in your office really uh, before the procedure is a much better indicator of your outcome than the MRI. The third part of the talk uh, that I want to get into is uh, some of the billing and coding and to talk about uh, the good and the bad and the ugly. These are some of the codes and again, the 10X has a, a wealth of information and some pretty, pretty brilliant, brilliant people that can help you with uh, billing and coding issues and also getting these claims uh, submitted to work comp and getting them authorized. Um, these are some of the codes that uh, we now bill for with the percutaneous tenotomy. And I'm gonna go over some of these codes individually here, but we can see the elbow, the femur, knee, the shoulder code for a single tendon, the plantar fascia, the Achilles, and the hip codes. 
And then there's two ultrasound codes. There's a 76881 and actually a 76882 that I'm going to go into, which is for examination of an extremity. And then the 76942 that you as a physician can bill for, for needle guidance under, under ultrasound um, imaging. Um, by the way, I'm going to have my email address and Dr. Mori's email address at the end of this presentation. So uh, you can also email either one of us questions afterwards. We'd be glad to help you out. I want to first look at the ultrasound codes. The most important one that I want you to know is the 76942. This code is for the actual ultrasound guidance for needle placement, and that's any needle. It's the, if you're doing injections in your office, if you're placing the TX1 or TX2 probe, this is a code that you should be billing as a physician for both the uh, professional component and the technical if you own the ultrasound. But one thing to remember is you can only bill one unit of service no matter how many times you are injecting uh, or needling. So it doesn't matter how many body parts, how many biopsies, how many injections you do, you can only bill this one time uh, per procedure. So if you're injecting somebody's knee and then you inject their distal quad, then you go and inject their Achilles, you can only bill this once. Um, and again, I, I save the image, whether you're uploading it into an EMR or putting it out to paper. This way there's no question that you actually did it and that you're not just saying it. For 2018, um, the average payment for Medicare for the professional component is $14.76. And if you own the ultrasound, they'll pay $17.28 for the technical component just for the needle guidance. I always submit a photo. It doesn't have to be labeled to show that I actually did this. Now, it's important to check with your local payer to see if they actually pay this code. It's always a secondary code. Work comp pays this. You want to check with your commercial insurances to see if they're going to pay this or not. Even if they don't pay it, I still submit it because I'm doing the work and I'll let them deny it every time and eventually bring that back onto the employer of, of my patient to tell them, hey, your patient, your, your employer is not paying for a very necessary component of me getting my needle in the right spot. So that's 76942 that you should be billing when you're doing this procedure. The second code that I bill is the 76882 and not so much the 76881. The reason is this, the 76881 is for the full examination of an extremity. 76882, as you see, is for a limited um, examination of the extremity. So this is the key right here. I think the majority of our exams are gonna be limited. We're looking at an elbow, we're looking at a foot and ankle, we're looking at a shoulder. We're not doing the entire limb. One of the ways you can get burned is if you're billing the 76881 for everything, and you submit a documentation of just one little picture. If you're not doing the whole limb, you only want to use 76882. This one does say that image documentation is required. Again, you can't just say I used ultrasound. And the average Medicare payment for both professional and technical component is about $59 just for doing that part of it. So every time I do a percutaneous tenotomy, I'm billing my, my CPT code for the procedure. I'm billing my uh, both components because I own the ultrasound for my 76942, and I'm billing for my examination of the extremity because I'm doing the work. I'm doing that work. I'm looking at that ultrasound, I'm finding that hypoechoic area, and I'm actually going to put my needle and probe into that area. So I'm billing those codes. The next slide are the 2018 Medicare rates. Um, and again, if anybody wants copies of these, I'll be happy to send them to you afterwards. So what I have on the left side, this is the physician fee schedule, and I give you the high and low. And for those of you not aware, Medicare has two separate um, physician schedules on there. One is if you do the procedure in a facility, such as a hospital outpatient department or an ambulatory surgery center. And then the other one is if you do it in your office. Sometimes, like you can see here, um, let me find one, here where the fee is higher if you do it in your office, they're paying you for your overhead, for your staff and supplies on there. A lot of times they're the same, so it doesn't matter if you're doing a tenotomy in the facility or if you're doing it in your office, it doesn't matter. And these are the high and the low. You're gonna to have to have your billers look up your um, local coverage determination, find out what area you're in and see where you fit into this. Um, these are the payments right now for the physician for just doing that procedure. This does not include the professional and technical components for both the different um, examinations of the extremity and for the ultrasound guidance. The, the one thing I want you to note is in 2018, from 2016 to 2018, 
Medicare did a significant cut in the reimbursement to ambulatory surgery centers and the payments. And again, these are the average payments. This is just the, the zero locale, so yours may be higher than this, um, to the ambulatory surgery center. Back in 2016, for a lot of these codes, like the percutaneous tonomy of the medial lateral epicondyle, Medicare was paying upwards of $2,400 to the surgery center. In 2016, they cut it to 1400 2017 to 1100 and in 2018, they cut the facility reimbursement to $737. Again, these are just Medicare rates. I want you to see that. Where comp is higher, commercial insurance is higher. So you can still turn a profit on these cases at an ASC. Um, the profit margin is pretty slim at this point um, because of how the cuts in Medicare, but that's just Medicare. The work comp rates usually two to three times more. If there is a concern, then you can see, uh, I apologize for not being able to get the 2018 hospital outpatient department, but the payments are two to three times higher on average for the hospital outpatient department. So they're always gonna make a profit. They're never gonna turn you away. But you can still do these at your surgery center and turn a profit on these. It's just the Medicare patient population um, it, it can get a little dicey, especially if you have to use the TX2 Pro because that is a little more expensive than the TX1. So know what your payments are, most importantly, know what your reimbursements are, and know which ones that you can and cannot bring to your facility. Uh, for me, the value in adding percutaneous tenotomy to our facility was that it did immediately bring a profitable procedure for our work comp, um, for our commercial insurances, and I actually hosted a cadaver lab in May of 2013 for some of our physicians. We did our first case in June of that same year. We credentialed our docs to do ultrasound guided tenotomies after hosting the cadaver lab. The ones who couldn't make it to the lab, I actually proctored in there. And I brought in new physicians. I brought in sports medicine. I brought in the non-operative um, physicians to my facility. So it wasn't just the surgeons that were doing these. I brought in 11 sports med docs and credential them and had them bringing patients in. It also then added procedures for our current physicians, for our orthopedic surgeons, our podiatry uh, physician, uh, doctors, and our pain management doctors who were not doing these procedures. It gave them one more case they could bring in instead of just doing steroid injections in the office and then losing the patients six months, 12 months down the line because they simply weren't getting better. Um, anesthesiologists like me, there's a lot of radiologists who are hospital-based that can hook up with a pain clinic, hook up with podiatrists, hook up, hook up with <clears throat> sports medicine clinics where people don't want to do the procedure. Do them right in your hospital outpatient department. And if you have downtime in your radiology lab, you can do these in your facility. It, it takes literally 15 minutes start to finish to do one of these. And you can immediately add value to, to your department and to your hospital. Again, there's established CPT codes. I highly encourage you not to use unlisted codes. The patient satisfaction scores are just off the chart. Uh, to have patients refer other patients to you because they've been suffering with plantar fasciitis for 10 years and six weeks after you treat them, they're better. This is why we went into medicine. This is where the passion comes from. You actually make people better with, with this technique. You, you'll make people better. You can cure people who have lost all hope. Um, the patients will market for you. They will tell their friends. They, they will post on Facebook and all these other social media that I stay away from because they're a big time suck. They will tell people and you'll have patients calling you, hey, you know, Dr. X got rid of my plantar fasciitis. I'm amazed. Look how much better I'm feeling. Um, and from the facility side, you're adding value to your physicians because you're now enabling them to do procedures that they can't do anywhere else and they don't have to do in their office. They can expand their practice. It keeps patients at your facility. And remember, patients are going to use technology to find out who's using this. They're going to find out who's doing this procedure, and if you're not doing it, they're going to go to your competitor down the street. So to sum up for me, the value proposition, low risk. Um, I do all mine without sedation. They go home quickly, virtually no complications. And because I let them see the screen at the same time where I'm hooking it up to my external monitor or letting them watch on my ultrasound, they're getting an instant healing from watching it as we go. Fast setup, quick turnover. And if you're already using ultrasound in your office to do injections, there's a very quick learning curve on here. Um, with this, you can upload the, the images into your EMR, and you can also query your EMR, your EHR in your office if you have that. You can look up the ICD-10 codes, or if you're still looking at the ICD-9, you can look up for lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis, patellar tendinopathy, 
Achilles tendinosis, plantar fasciitis. Scan your database of patients. Find those patients who were lost to follow up. Call them up. Hey, I have this new treatment. Come in. I'll scan you. We'll see if we can make you better. And you will find these patients that you thought were gone. The support from 10X is, is phenomenal, and I won't go there, but you can see all the assistance they give you. And with the TX tube probe now, we can treat the hip, the shoulder, the hamstring. Um, quite a bit that I went over with you right now. Um, we will take any questions. I give you my email and Dr. Mori's email on there. I'm going to leave that slide up for a bit. So if you do have questions, I really highly encourage you to please contact me. Dr. Mori's trying to be a gentleman as always and trying to field the questions first, but uh, I encourage you uh, to contact me. I, I just have such a genuine passion for this procedure because it works. In my 27 years in practice, it's just so unusual to find something that is such a game changer. This is, this is truly disruptive technology. It, it, it's disruptive care for patients that are living without hope. And you can actually not only give them hope, you can make them better. Good. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much. That was, I think, an outstanding presentation, Tom. And I'm sure everybody that has uh, joined us, and there's been around 60 uh, participants, have appreciated the uh, breadth and depth of your presentation. You did go somewhat quickly, as you said, but it didn't seem rushed. And I think you uh, provided a great background as well as finishing with great practical points. Um, we would uh, welcome uh, uh, those who are in attendance to send in their questions. There are, have been several that have been sent in, as you might imagine, they do relate to um, reimbursement issues, which was, uh, Tom, as we talked about, anticipated. And so let me just ask uh, them as they come. Um, one uh, is very simple. Have you had experience with the perineal tendon? And what about coding for that? And if I could add a little color. When we talk about the perineal tendon, um, th this also uh, an area that uh, we've just recently been thinking about and talking about has to do with uh, a tendonitis and tenosynovitis. And um, Tom, have you had experience with treating uh, a tendonitis and not a, necessarily a, an impending rupture or necrosis or, or degenerative port process? Um, and have you also had occasion to treat the um, the perineus brevis or longest? And if so, do you have recommendations for coding? I, I don't have uh, any experience with uh, the perineus brevis and longest. And what I've done, even with the knee code, there, there's more of a hamstring code. Um, you can look it up. You can do the crosswalk, have your builders do a crosswalk. And when you submit that code under your comment section, I, put, I will always have my biller I actually put in there um, no applicable code, you know, so there's no real applicable applicable code for this using the most similar code crosswalked to this. So if you can't find a good code for um, hand, for foot and ankle, for, for something for hip, um, find the code that is most similar to that and then definitely put a narrative on the screen on your, when you submit the bill on there. Um, and I see somebody put a, a note in there and they are correct, the 27005 and 27006 for two of the hip um, tendons. Um, one of those disappeared in 2016, and one of those disappeared in 2018 from the Medicare Ambulatory Surgery Center payment list. Um, so suggest what I suggest doing then, um, if they're not gonna be paid, if it's a work comp, if work comp is falling, which they will do quickly, um, take them to an inpatient hospital department, or uh, at last resort, if you really feel that it's gonna benefit the patient, you can always just do a cash payment with the patient, which was always something that I tried to do at the, at the um, my last suggestion. Um, it is effective technology for gluteus medius when you get those patients that have what they thought was impingement, they've had their bursa injected, it doesn't relieve their pain, and you find that doing this takes away their pain. So I didn't mean to get off track, uh, Dr. Mori, but um, that's what I know that one. It's fine. No, no, uh, I think that one of the most important things that uh, one might take away from the presentation is the is what you had just mentioned, Tom, and that is um, it, the concept of crosswalking. In other words, if you are up front with what you're doing and say there is no exact code, but this closely, most closely resembles it for these reasons. In other words, it's a narrative. I think that gives you a better chance. 
having said that, let me just tell you that um, tonight uh, on this webinar, we have uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Tom Holder, who has uh, been hired specifically to help oversee our reimbursement initiative. And uh, 10X has um, hired some additional coding experts to help us with their advice on how do we handle some of these issues. The, the headwinds is people I'm sure recognize that are on the webinar are that the insurance companies are looking for reasons not to reimburse. And um, uh, the uh, approach has to be that, uh, as Tom said, many, many, many times we're helping our patients, we're doing the right thing, find a code that is similar and then show why it's legitimate to use this. There are also, you should be aware that there's uh, coding modifiers that allows you to decrease what might be considered the extent of your procedure. For example, if a code says complete tenotomy and you're just removing the disease portion, we feel, and we're exploring this now, this is not definitive, that a uh, 51 modifier will allow us to say that the procedure was stopped before the tendon was completely cut through because what was left, of course, was normal tendon. So the, the message that I would uh, uh, offer for several of these questions are that, that we are actively and aggressively pursuing the reimbursement question as it relates to the appropriate codes. And also uh, there was a question regarding the insurance companies. The insurance companies, as you know, are quite variable in terms of their interpretation. There's also quite a difference um, in the different parts of the country, what the, the companies were, are willing to reimburse. And so once again, the most effective approach is if you do get a denial from an insurance company is to request a face-to-face -face or a peer-to-peer -peer, um, discussion. And in our experience, that has been effective at least 50% of the time where you can get a reversal in the, uh, in the reimbursement. Uh, and what I want to add to that, um, and Dr. Moria and I have talked at length about this as well. Um, again, remember the rates I'm showing you are just for Medicare. Somebody made a comment in that it seems that it doesn't even barely cover the cost of the needle, kind of making it a net negative revenue procedure for the surgery center. The number of Medicare patients that we did this on was, was pretty small. Again, we saw the average age range between 40 and 60. So majority of these are going to be either commercial insurance, um, cash pay, or they're going to be work comp on there. Um, my thought process always was if one of my physicians had um, four procedures on the schedule, whether it's a podiatrist doing cases and wants to do a tenotomy on somebody, he's already brought four cases. We have to remember that they're our customer too. I want to keep that physician happy. Uh, anybody who's run a surgery center knows that at times you've taken a case at a loss, knowing that you're making the doctor happy by keeping their case on the schedule. It's not enough just to do that case and kind of bite the bullet. You need to make sure that surgeon knows, oh, by the way, Dr. Jones, or Dr. Smith, um, we'll do that tenotomy here. We're, we're, gonna, we're hardly going to break even on that, but I'm doing it as a favor to you because we value you so much at our facility and we want to keep you happy. Because um, I've had surgeons in the past, you know, some, in some places, if you're in Florida or you're in California, there's a surgery center on almost every corner. And a lot of these docs work at multiple facilities. And if, and if you don't want to do it, somebody else will. So I want to make sure that physician that I that I keep them happy on there. Um, another point that that I really want to stress um, to the physicians doing these, please, please do not in your dictation say that I did a 10x procedure. There is no such thing as a 10x procedure. We know we Xerox something, we grab some Kleenex, you know, now we we Uber. You're doing a percutaneous tenotomy of the common extensor tendon under ultrasound guidance. That is your procedure. In the body of your work, you can talk about which ultrasound probe you use. You can talk about the 18 gauge needle. I use the TX1. That's all in the body of your work. But in your dictation, when you're billing your three codes, my 24357, percutaneous anatomy, lateral epicondyle under ultrasound guidance. Number two, 76882, limited uh, examination under ultrasound. Number three, 76942, needle guidance under ultrasound. I think that's where a lot of the claims get denied immediately. The insurers see 10x procedure, they deny it. The second part of that is also, go ahead, Dr. Morgan. No, no, finish. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I said the, the second part of that is if you get a denial, then I would, I used to ask my, my blues especially, um, then show me in your handbook where you do not cover this procedure. I want to see where this is an excluded procedure in there. 
some of them are doing that. Some of them are simply saying, we are not covering percutaneous tenotomies any longer. If that's the case, then it's, it's a denied procedure. You have every right to go to your patient and say, your insurance doesn't cover this. It's no different than uh, a bone marrow aspirate or PRP. They don't cover it. You're always welcome to pay cash. Um, but if they can't give you in writing that they don't cover it, then you keep fighting and appealing it because if it's a covered procedure in there or the, the contrary, they can't show it's not a, a denied procedure. You have every right to get paid. Uh, that was one of the points that I was I was going to make, and we had a question that came in that that asked about paying cash. And in San Antonio, where I do these, uh, I do them in a in a non-ambulatory surgical center, a cast room. We don't get uh, a reimbursed for that, uh, so we we do uh, get paid cash. And uh, our volume has dropped off some, but patients are still coming in and, and having it done. Um, the other thing that I would uh, mention as a direction of the company. Just because so many, we have several questions that are all around the issues of billing and denial. Is one of the areas that uh, I'm exploring with my colleagues, um, as I mentioned earlier, is um, uh, recommendations on how we phrase our procedure. And uh, as an example, um, if there is a vehement objection to allowing us to use a percutaneous code, um, the question comes up if you make a five millimeter incision. Um, some might say that's a small incision. I mean, it is an incision. It's a small incision. And if that blade carries through the subcutaneous tissue and then you make an incision in the fascia, which is the way I treat, for example, tennis elbow so that I can introduce my probe easier, um, you can dictate that you carried that incision through three layers. And some are suggesting to call it a limited open procedure and then do another 52 modifier that says, but the uh, it, it was uh, limited in its scope, so to speak. So we're not recommending that this be done at the moment, but this is one of the avenues that the company is exploring to, um, again, kind of go to the point of the crosswalk that says, there's not a perfect uh, code for this. This is the closest one we have. And then we qualify it with our verbal di dictation and, dis and description of what we do. The one thing that I would emphasize again that Tom mentioned that's really critically important is do not use the word 10x in any of your discussions. Uh, we are working now on a generic um, uh, dictation, if you will, where we're not even talking about an ultrasonic probe, but we're talking about the surgical instrument or the instrument was introduced under ultrasound guidance to the site of the pathology and the uh, disease tendon was resected or cut. And so we, we haven't totally finalized that initiative, but we're very close. And then we, will, of course, will disseminate um, our recommendations once we validate them and know that they are, um, are legitimate. But uh, one of the, I guess, one of the key points is that we don't have all of the answers tonight, but we have heard, I think, from uh, quite a number of sources, the concerns. And, of course, we share those concerns. We're aware of them. And it's probably our number one uh, priority as a company is to reassess this and to see if we can't uh, provide better uh, uh, guidance to our uh, to our users. The the best part of all of this is just the wealth of knowledge and experience that um, Dr. Mori brings to the table and his experience uh, as a physician and as a leader. Um, and also again, Mr. Holder, who is uh, working diligently to um, keep promoting this the, the trend that we want to see going forward, which is having all the payers realize that that, that this is a cost-effective procedure that works. Um, it, it, it's maddening to me, uh, and again, that's part of my passion, as Dr. Mori has, has learned recently. Um, when when you come out with new technologies such as this, that can genuinely change patients' lives. And insurance companies, like they always do, want to deny, deny, deny. I think the same thing will happen with PRP, with bone marrow concentrate and the uh, hemopoietic stem cells. This is in that same range of technology. This is just so much more proven. Uh, it's been out there longer. It, it's immediately evident, and your patients get better. Um, they can always, they can always pay cash. And I've never had a patient that paid cash that regretted it in the, the five plus years that I've been doing these. Um, 
I see one last question that I'll answer on here, Dr. Mori, about the resource for finding post-procedure protocol for weight, you know, weight bearing, non-weight bearing, yes. mobilization. Yeah, yeah. I, I was um, going to bring that. That's the one that doesn't relate to reimbursement uh, that we should answer before we close. So go ahead and take that one. Um, in every kit, there's a there's a dictation template in there, and there's also a set of post-op instructions that you can that has a little checkbox to make it easier. If you go on to the physician section of the um, Tenex Health website. There's a lot of different information on there about wake bearing and non wake bearing. I can tell you in my practice, um, when I do Achilles or plantar fascia, I don't put them in a boot unless they come in with one. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing the treatment. I'm not seeing them in my office every day, so people are sending them to me. So if they're not in a boot, I don't put them in it. Um, I don't make them non weight bearing. Um, for the um, upper extremity, I tell them you carry nothing heavier than a dinner plate for the first three days. Again, seven days to start uh, limited activity, 14 days back to normal activity, and in three weeks, go back to full activity. Um, the healing really is that traumatic in there. The only time I don't do that, again, is if I find those um, mid-substance interstitial tears in the Achilles or in the extensor or flexor tendon or in the plantar fascia. If I'm injecting on one side and I see the local blowing out the other side and I know they got a ruptured fascia, then I will keep them on a little bit longer non-exercise um, non schedule I probably just double everything on there. The beauty of this is it's it's really, really difficult to hurt somebody with this technology. You have to really go out of your way to cause harm, as you see by the safety profile. Yeah, it, it, let me add one thing real quick, and then, then we can stop since we're uh, over time. With regard to the question of post-op, I, I do exactly the same thing. They come in with the boot, I send them out with the boot and wean them from it uh, as uh, tolerated. If they don't come in with the boot for plantar fascia or Achilles, I, don't, I do not. Uh, prescribe one. Um, the question uh, with regard to activity, I tell them three days don't do much to let the blood clot form because our research suggests that what 10x does is it removes the degenerative tendon, but then it also stimulates healing. And so that comes through the blood clot. So you don't want to knock that off. And then I give them three weeks of sedentary activity that allows the healing process signals to become established so that there's a physiologic healing stimulated by 10x. At the three week check, if they're doing well, then I allow them to increase activity toward normal and get a six week check. If by six weeks they say, yeah, it's better, it's not perfect, but it's really doing well, I allow them to gradually resume normal activity. The time frame, think of a bell shaped curve and think of the tail on the left with time going from left to right. About 10% of the patients will have a dramatic improvement and never look back. They'll never hurt again. And I think that's those patients that are in a, a kind of acute chemical inflammatory phase. I think we suck out the cytokines with the uh, procedure and they just, they don't feel much anymore. Most patients, about 80% of the patients that are gonna get well will get well by three months. So I tell them that's kind of the, the um, target. Uh, but I do have patients that have continued to improve. They were not where they needed to be at three months, but by six months they were. So I think in the right side of the bell-shaped curve, about 10% of the patients will continue to improve up to six months. I generally consider it to be a failure of treatment. If by six months uh, they're, they're uh, maybe better but not good enough, or even after four to five months, if they say, uh, not only are they not where they want to be, they're no better than they were to start with. And in those instances, in the, since I've been doing these in 2011, I've not put a blade to any tendinopathy. The only failures of 10X, and I think I have about eight in, in 500 cases, and about four of those are not failures as such, but extensions of the process. In other words, the tendinopathy was in a different location, close by, but a different part of the tendon. Um, they all wanted the 10X again. Nobody uh, wanted surgery and nobody wanted to wait it out. They all wanted me to treat them again. So it's, it's pretty similar, I think, to what Tom was actually saying. But the last thing I'll mention is one of the areas that 10X could really benefit from is a prospect of randomized study on you might say activity is tolerated versus a structured program to see if it really matters. The problem is kind of from a, an analytical standpoint, 
if you got something that's ninety percent successful already, and we don't have that good a data on what the structured post procedure protocol should be, it's going to take a tremendous power. In other words, a lot of patience before you're going to tell, be able to distinguish a better po one one post procedure protocol from the other. But it's still a worthwhile thing to think about. And when people say, "What can I do to study the 10x procedure?" My recommendation has been study the post-operative uh, program, either activity is tolerated versus something more structured, depending upon what anatomic part you're talking about. Now, we didn't get through everything, uh, I'm sure, mm -hmm. but um, I think um, we did uh, uh, address at least uh, some of the questions. As Tom said, please don't hesitate to use the uh, email addresses for either Tom or myself, <laughs> and uh, we will be happy to try to uh, answer any residual questions that we glossed over or didn't answer to your satisfaction. So in closing, Tom, add, any last comments? I just want to add one last thing. Yeah, my last closing comment is um, people have asked me in the past when I've done cadaver labs and done uh, other talks. If I inject PRP at the same time that I'm doing the percutaneous anatomy, my answer is no. Um, I, I'm a big fan of let one modality work. Um, if a patient comes down the road, I see the PRP as kind of a touch-up procedure. Um, if I'm physically removing that tendon that is the source of their pain, and I see it's improved on there, I don't want to muddy the waters by now injecting a secondary product that might cause more inflammation, might cause more pain. I'd rather let the percutaneous anatomy work because we've had such great success with that. And if they need a secondary treatment with PRP down the road, I will do that. Um, but I, I, I have never done it at the same time that I'm doing a percutaneous tenotomy. So that's my answer. I want to thank Good. Dr. Mori. I want to thank everybody at 10X Health for allowing me to share my passion for this. Um, and for those of you who actually had the patience to listen to all of this, God bless you. I, I don't know that uh, I can listen <laughs> to you talk for that long. Uh, but again, Dr. Mori, thank you. Not at all. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, everyone, for your time and have a nice evening.